Okay, we are now live. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is James Lin. I am an assistant professor of international studies at the University of Washington. Uh, tonight, we have our book talk for uh, Professor Jinwen Gong. Um, so let me first introduce Dr. Gong first, and then uh, we'll get right to it. Uh, but oh, a quick reminder, we have a couple more events uh, coming up just in the next week or so. Uh, tomorrow, we have a very honored visit from Representative Xiao Bi Kim, who will be coming to uh, Seattle in the morning. Uh, so we have an exciting talk with her tomorrow morning. And then next Monday, we'll have another book talk from Professor Scott Simon, uh, his new book, which isn't even out yet. It's, it'll be out in the next couple of weeks, uh, Truly Human, which is about Indigenous Taiwanese peoples. Okay, um, so I'd like to introduce our, our honored guest for this evening. Um, Jiwen Gong is Assistant Professor of History at the National University of Singapore. Born and raised in Singapore, he received his BA in History and English from Dartmouth College and his PhD in Modern Chinese and International Global History from Columbia University. His scholarship has been published in Modern Asian Studies, the International History Review, and Asian Ethnicity. With funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the National Heritage Board in Singapore, his next project is a cultural history of Singapore, China, and Taiwan relations in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, tonight, we have the honor of having Professor Gong discuss his most recently published book, Diaspora Cold Warriors, Nationalist China, Anti-Communism, and the Philippine Chinese, 1930s to 1970s, published by Cornell University Press last year in 2022. Um, so this is a project that I've been familiar with for a long time. I uh, read different parts of different chapters, and um, it's really exciting to see uh, not only the book in print, which I'm teaching this quarter in my graduate seminar, uh, but also to welcome, finally, uh, Professor Gong to speak for the Taiwan Studies Program here at the University of Washington. Okay, I'll hand it over. Go ahead, Jim. All right. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, James. That was, here we go. I'll just share my uh, slides. Thank you so much, James. I'm, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, I'll be virtually to talk about my book uh, to a North American audience, uh, to the to the Taiwan Studies program uh, at the University of Washington. Um, and again, you know, James, I, I, I should mention, as, as James did, that, uh, that James was very much part of the making uh, of this book over the last, sheesh, over the last decade. OK, so let me let me first start off by explaining what the book is about. Uh, the book explains how and why in the second half of the 20th century, the Philippine Chinese became the most enthusiastic diasporic Chinese supporters of the Republic of China on Taiwan and its ruling Chinese Nationalist Party in Southeast Asia. The, you know, there were fears of so-called Chinese communism uh, throughout the region at the time, but I argue in my book that the so-called China that intervened the most extensively in any regional country during this period was not the People's Republic of China, but the, uh, but the ROC. Uh, my story begins in the first half of the century, during which the Kuomintang institutionalized itself in the Philippines and clashed with uh, pro-CCP left-wing Chinese organizations in the years leading up to the Japanese occupation. Uh, notably, the Philippine Kuomintang became dominated over time by a right-wing faction with ties to the quasi-fascist blue shirts in China. The Secretary General of the Kuomintang in Taiwan from 1985 to 1987, around the time that martial law came to an end, uh, a man named uh, Ma Shuli, uh, was briefly part of this extreme right-wing faction of the Philippine PMT uh, in the 1930s. By the end of the 1940s, however, so we'll, we'll skip the Second World War here. Uh, by the end of the, the 1940s, following what the, the Kuomintang called a period of bloody struggle between left and right Chinese factions in the Philippines, the majority of Philippine Chinese left-wing leaders had returned to China, uh, enabling Taipei to consolidate its hold over one of the smallest Chinese communities in Southeast Asia with the participation of the Philippine government, although not, as I'll explain subsequently, the United States. So this is in part a Cold War narrative. 
but not one that quite fits with how we understand the Cold War in, in this part of the world. Nationalist China's influence in the Philippines was characterized by a near hegemony over Chinese education and key community institutions, including the Federation of Filipino Chinese Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, the Guomindang itself, uh, schools such as Chiang Kai-shek High School or College in, in Manila, and an organization called the Philippine Chinese Anti-Communist League. And it's through these organizations that Taipei mobilized the Philippine Chinese, most of whom were, I should, I should note, legally Chinese nationals, right? it's in support of its overarching goal of counterattacking the mainland and opposing communism and, and resisting Russia. So it's really important to bear in mind here that most Philippine Chinese at the time were legally uh, nationals of the, the Republic of China. And so during these decades, from the 1950s to 70s and even beyond, uh, visits to Taiwan, such as those you see here, uh, were common. The cover of my book is based on the photo on the left, which shows Chiang Kai-shek greeting Philippine Chinese students who are in Taiwan for uh, quote unquote military service or Junzhong Fu. And on the right is a uh, an image of a Philippine Chinese KMT member presenting Chiang Kai-shek with a gold 3D map of China in, in August 1950. So this is really not long after the KMT has, has left, uh, has quit uh, China for, for Taiwan. The, uh, during this period, during this, uh, during the 50s, from the 50s to 70s, uh, more perniciously, I, I think, uh, the Kuomintang collaborated with the Philippine state, especially Philippine military intelligence, to silence dissenting and heterodox voices within the community by identifying them as communists. And many such persons ended up uh, being deported to Taiwan. After all, Philippine Chinese were mostly Chinese nationals. Uh, two of the most famous persons to be deported to Taiwan were Quintin and Rizal Yutong, of the Chinese Commercial News, which was the Philippines' most widely read Chinese newspaper at the time. And their offense or their crime as, as liberals was to have provided balanced news coverage of developments in China and Taiwan, to have advocated for Chinese cultural integration into the Philippine na uh, nation state in opposition to the Sinocentrism and ethnic chauvinism uh, of the Kuomintang, and uh, on this uh, on this slide we have, we have a uh, an image of the two brothers uh, being read, uh, being told uh, what their offenses were by the Philippine Immigration Commissioner, and also a quite a re remarkable document that I found in uh, various archives actually, uh, a uh, classified document, a highly a secret document uh, called the Execution of the Chinese Commercial News Case amid developing demonstrations and revolts and guidelines for future work in the Philippines, uh, written by none other than uh, Ma Shuli, the, uh, the person whom I mentioned earlier. Uh, by this point in time, Ma Shuli was, in, was based in Taiwan. And so my book ends with these two men, right, with Quintin and Rizal Yuitong in the, in the 1970s, early 1970s, after which, of course, things changed. Under martial law, Ferdinand Marcos Sr. vastly simplified the naturalization process for foreign nationals in 1972 and established formal diplomatic relations with the PRC in 1975. And so over time, although quite slowly, uh, Kuomintang influence waned in proportion uh, as ties between the Philippines and the PRC uh, expanded. And that's how we get uh, to the to the present uh, day, but, but that's not something that I talk about too much in my in my book. So, uh, what I'll now talk about are some of the main arguments that the uh, book makes. Um, the the question of you know how I would position myself in relation to existing scholarship was was a tricky one because uh, my topic doesn't really fit into easily into area studies subfields, right? Like China or, or Taiwan or 
or Southeast Asia, or, or even Chinese migration history. So I had to sort of pick and choose my scholarly engagements. And in the end, I settled on, on three interventions. And so the first intervention is really addressed at historians of modern China and Taiwan, um, especially those in Anglo-American academia. Most of whom have written about the Kuomintang, chiefly from the era studies perspective of its nation building strategies, its ideology, right? During the Nanjing decade in China, 1928 to 37, uh, during the Second Sino Japanese War, and in, in Taiwan after uh, 1945, and especially 1949. So, this is how I encountered the Kuomintang in grad school, right? Through scholarship by the likes of Brian Sway and, and Maggie Clinton. And it's typically, I think, how historians and the general reading public today envision the party. In my conversations with uh, many China historians and, and Taiwan historians, they frequently expressed surprise that there was a KMT in the Philippines um, at all. Yet, if you read Kuomintang propaganda from the 1930s onwards, or, in, or dig into its archives and that of the, the Republic of China Foreign Ministry, it becomes readily apparent that the party state set great store by the mobilization of persons it referred to as overseas Chinese or Hua Xiao. We find that its 1929 nationality law formally defined such persons as quote unquote Chinese nationals, right? according to the principle of uh, blood right citizenship or use sanguinis. Uh, citizenship. Right? So the overseas Chinese were supposedly right, the mother of the revolution, according to uh, uh, according to Sun Yat-sen, although he may not actually have uttered that exact phrase. So by building on a much less sizable and somewhat older body of scholarship on the Kuomintang in Southeast Asia and the Americas, I make the case in my book for understanding the Kuomintang as a networked and transnational organization that connected first China and then Taiwan to so-called Chinese communities abroad. And even though this organization uh, or these, these organizations' networks overlapped and leveraged the migration networks that you know, Adam McKeown and other historians of the Chinese diaspora have studied, it was a different type of transnational formation. You get a sense of that from the table, uh, the flowchart on, on the right, which is in my book, uh, a flowchart that shows that branches, uh, the KMT branches, schools, civic organizations, and diplomatic organs were both embedded in overseas Chinese societies, or what the Kuomintang sometimes described as Hai Wai, and which were also linked hierarchically to a center or Zhongyang, whether or not the center was in Nanjing, uh, Chongqing, or after 1949, uh, Taipei. And I think thinking about the Kuomintang transnationally underscores the territorial incompleteness, the partial sovereignty of this peculiar entity we refer to as the Republic of China from its inception in, in 1912, right? And in the eyes of its partisans, uh, the, the, the an incompleteness that results in the party states uh, turning outwards towards uh, Nanyang and elsewhere in, in search of support. Now, one question that I get, I, I get asked a lot is whether or not we can think about the CCP and the PRC diasporically. Uh, so my book focuses uh, more on the Kuomintang and anti-communism than on Chinese left-wing movements. But I will say that we can think of Chinese communism uh, diasporically. My, so my, my, my friend Zhou Tamo has, has pointed this out in her wonderful book, uh, Migration in the Time of Revolution. I would argue that despite the presence of Chinese uh, communist sympathizers overseas, both alleged and actual, the CCP was not as formally institutionalized diasporically to the extent uh, that the Kuomintang was. 
Moreover, uh, unlike the Kuomintang, the CCP after 1949 focused on nation building in a more conventional territorialized sense. It officially jettisons it, it, its ethno, legal, and ideological claims upon the Chinese diaspora from the mid 1950s uh, onwards following the, the Bandung Conference. Uh, conversely, the Republic of China engaged in no such act of repudiation and, in fact, maintained blood right citizenship until 2000. So that's my, my, first, uh, my first intervention. Uh, the second is about understanding the complicated three-way relationship between the Philippine state, the ROC state, and the Philippine Chinese, and using this relationship to rethink the Cold War in East and Southeast Asia. So I, I draw upon the political scientist, Stephen Krasner, uh, to argue that Taipei and Manila's relations with respect to the Philippine Chinese amounted to an, uh, an arrangement of what I called shared uh, sovereignty. Right. This was a marriage of convenience characterized by shifting but relatively equal power relations between Taipei and Manila, and by the willingness of the Philippine government to allow the KMT to operate openly in the Philippines, uh, and by the willingness of, of the Philippine government to collaborate with the KMT and the Chinese community to construct and purge so-called Chinese communists. Uh, Manila relied on ROC diplomats. It relied on grassroots Kuomintang activists to compensate for the Philippine military's ignorance of the Chinese language. Right? And, and this was necessary in order for the state to police and surveil Chinese society. And on, from Taipei's point of view, Taipei simply lacked the means to impose itself on the Philippines without Manila's participation and consent. Right? Uh, Taipei understood this, it acknowledged this, and if we turn to elsewhere in Southeast Asia, this, this, the, the limits of the ROCs uh, influence and power become, I think, quite uh, obvious, right? In, in other parts of Southeast Asia, the Kuomintang was proscribed by authorities in countries such as Malaya, Thailand, and, and South Vietnam. And so all of this, I think, is what makes the Philippines fairly distinct as a, uh, as a site for thinking about uh, the overseas Kuomintang. So shared sovereignty uh, is also, I think, useful for me in engaging with and pushing back against narratives of the Cold War in East Asia. So my book aligns with scholarship by the likes of Ang Cheng Guan and, and uh, Liu Wenqing, for example, who have called attention to how important the fears of the PRC and the overseas Chinese as potential fifth columnists were to understanding the dynamics of the Cold War in this part of the world. Uh, but on the other hand, and this may come as a bit of a surprise, uh, this is not a US-centric narrative. Right? So the states involved were close allies of the United States. And the United States is not absent from this book, which drew, you know, which draws quite quite a bit on, on US archival materials. Uh, but these materials suggest that US involvement in the Philippine Chinese community was largely that of an observer and did not go much beyond disseminating print propaganda after 1950. It was the Kuomintang, right? It was Taipei, the, the ROC embassy, that drove this propaganda effort on the ground. It was the Kuomintang and the Philippine military, but not the United States, that did the dirty work of an identifying and arresting Chinese communists, right? So-called Chinese communists or sympathizers such as the, the Yujung brothers. So my book then is partly a response to historians of the United States and the world, right? and to the uh, response to the critique of the US-Asia binary that structures so many narratives of the Cold War in this region. So what I'm trying to do uh, is, is decenter the United States and emphasize the agency and relative autonomy of Asian transnational actors in constructing Cold War anti-communist relations. Uh, 
And these relations are both between states and between states and peoples. And so these linkages helped constitute what I call adapting the anthropologist Susan Bailey's concept of a socialist ecumene. Uh, these linkages constitute what I call an intra-Asian anti-communist ecumene, right? comprising Guomindang networks, uh, flows of Philippine Chinese students, teachers, and tourists from the Philippines to Taiwan, uh, and transnational anti-communist organizations as well, such as the Asian People's Anti-Communist League. Right, so that's my that's my second uh, major argument. Uh, finally, as a work of social and cultural history, uh, my book challenges prevailing narratives of the Philippine Chinese community that focus on ethnocultural identity and integration. Right, narratives that focus on the business community but that exclude Cold War politics and ideology. And so, for example, in the many narratives of the Chinoy, uh, Philippine Chinese community, produced by Chinois themselves, uh, such as this coffee table book, right, uh, produced by the leading Chinoy organization, uh, Kaisa Para Sal Kalaran, uh, the Guangdong and, and Taiwan are, are conspicuous by their absence. And I think this is understandable, given how such uh, narratives, such narratives that come out of the community, emphasize the contributions of Chinese migrants and their descendants to a multicultural Philippine nation. These books are a response to the endemic anti-Chinese racism and, and discrimination and, and accusations of disloyalty, which unfortunately have intensified in recent years. And so even though Kuomintang hegemony is well known among older Chinois, as my conversations with them have revealed, it's politically somewhat awkward and inconvenient for the community to highlight how an earlier generation of Philippine Chinese uh, were vociferous supporters of a, uh, a certain China. So we also find in, in what little scholarship uh, there is on the post-war Philippine Chinese uh, an inordinate emphasis on the business community, whose interests are depicted as synonymous with those of Chinese society uh, in general. Uh, the business community whom social scientists tend to depict as above politics, as, as, or at least as uninterested in, in China-centered politics. Right? Uh, persons whose focus was on adapting to discriminatory economic policies, for example. So there's a rupture, I think, between these oddly depoliticized narratives of the post-1945 Chinese community in the Philippines and narratives of the pre-1945 period that are attentive to, for example, mobilization in support of the, the war resistance against Japan. And so my, arg my argument in response to these narratives is, you know, is, is basically as follows. First, we need to think about how the sharing of sovereignty between Taipei and Manila how transnational Kuomintang networks and Cold War ideology shaped Chinese identity in the Philippines and were instrumental, in fact, to how the Chinese fashioned themselves as what I, you know, as, as ideological subjects, as ethno-ideological post-colonial subjects in the face of discrimination and prejudice. Because for many Philippine Chinese, as, as legal aliens, right, and as ethnic minorities, performing the right ideology, uh, an ideology shared by the ROC and the Philippine states, was a means for them to prove that they were good residents of the Philippines. It was a means for them to ingratiate themselves with the authorities, to win intracommunal power struggles, and to profit by means of uh, shady activity. And so ideology in this sense was both uh, about uh, was about both belief and expediency. It's always a bit tricky to try to parse the motivations of persons, but you know, for historians, because historians prefer studying, I think, manifestations of intentionality, right? Uh, in my case, I'm interested in, in, in the, the performative aspects of, of Cold War anti-communism. And these range from forming civic institutions such as the 
Chinese Anti-Communist League. Right? Uh, it entailed fundraising in support of the ROC. It entailed blackmailing and informing on suspected Chinese communists to the state. Uh, these diverse anti-communist practices helped Chinese mitigate racial prejudices towards them by emphasizing their ideological bona fides. And crucially, uh, not all such practicing communists were, were businessmen. So I get, a lot, I get asked a lot about economic ties between the Philippine Chinese and the ROC. And my short answer to this question is that such ties existed, but are have proven difficult to, to study. Uh, more than that, my book is about more than just the, the business community. Uh, there were certainly prominent uh, Filipino Chinese business leaders who, who were committed diaspora cold warriors, but there were also journalists, right? Media figures, educators affiliated with the Kuomintang, like the like Bao Shitian, the longtime principal of Chiang Kai-shek College. He's the guy shaking hands with, with Chiang Kai-shek, right? Uh, in this in the image. Uh, like Xin Guangzhu, the man on the, the bottom left, uh, who was editor in chief of the uh, Kuomintang newspaper in the Philippines. Uh, men like uh, Ma Shuli, for example. Uh, women, even like the the radio host uh, Mary Yu, right, um, who is shown here uh, visiting Taiwan in in 1961. And so, finally, on the question of ideology, in the absence of a sizable uh, Chinese left wing movement in the Philippines after the late 1940s, where might one turn to for evidence of resistance? to the Kuomintang, evidence of, of contestation. Uh, so I like to think of my book as a study in hegemony or near hegemony, but this hegemony wasn't uncontested. However, the contestation, this, this contestation manifested itself indirectly right, as what I call anti-anti-communism or non-anti-communism rather than in the form of full-throated support for the People's Republic of China. So the Chinese commercial news, for example, registered its discomfort with the ideological status quo by publishing articles that both praised and criticized both Chinas. Right? Centrism was a was a was a veiled critique of of, of right wing extremism. Uh, uh, the, the, the newspaper crit, uh, critiqued the Kuomintang's ethnocentrism and chauvinism uh, by putting forth, by proposing and performing an alternative ethno-political subjectivity. And, and because of this liberal centrist position that they took, the Yujung brothers ran afoul of the establishment and were deported to Taiwan. Right, so those are my three broad historiographical claims. Right, about the transnationalism of the KMT, about the sharing of sovereignty between Manila and Taipei in the context of an, an intra-Asian Cold War, and about the significance of ideology to understanding diasporic Chinese identity. And I want to conclude with a few thoughts on, on the broader implications of the book right, and where we can, we can go from here. So one point I want to make, or one thing that I would you know, perhaps uh, like us to think about is, is the question of, of comparisons and, and translatability. So my book isn't a comparative history. So those are quite tricky to, to write. There are moments in my book when I look beyond the Philippines to other Southeast Asian countries. Uh, yet, I think that the book, I hope that the book supplies concepts and narratives that translate across borders and that can illuminate the Kuomintang elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia. About, where, about which there is little scholarship, but rich deposits of uh, primary sources. Uh, in writing about shared sovereignty, I hope that other scholars will, will think about how colonial and post-colonial states in this region constrain the operations of the party among Chinese populations in the name of assimilating them into various national body politics. Second, a second sort of Concluding, uh, concluding point. Uh, I hope that my book can be helpful to those of us interested in historicizing relations between China and Southeast Asia. 
So rather than tracing a linear trajectory between the PRC in, in during the Cold War and the PRC today, I call attention to the Republic of China as an antecedent to the PRC's involvement in the region in our own time. So if we can draw, and, and lots of you know, historians have done this, if we can draw synchronic, uh, synchronic comparisons between the Kuomintang and the CCP as authoritarian Marxist-Leninist regimes, then we can also engage in diachronic comparisons between the historical KMT, the KMT that I talk about, and the contemporary Chinese Communist Party. Uh, both, for example, were, were committed to promoting a certain certain notions of Chineseness. Both were committed to sinicizing or re-sinicizing the region's Chinese. Uh, it's, it's quite telling that a, a current uh, employee of the Chinese commercial news in, in Manila, uh, whose father also worked for the paper, said to be once that Beijing's cultural diplomacy among the Philippine Chinese today resembles what Taipei was doing half a century earlier. Uh, finally, I hope that we, and, and, my, and by we here, I, my, by, by my, my interlocutors here are really uh, persons in, in North American area studies, I hope that we can move beyond, quote unquote, Chinese history as a field that is centered on the mainland uh, as a territorialized space for the unfolding of the Chinese past. Uh, even excellent recent books on the Chinese diaspora by the likes of uh, Shelley Chan and, and Wayne Soon, I'd argue, are China-centric in that they are principally concerned with how the diaspora changed uh, China, although uh, Wayne Soon also talks a little bit about the, the Republic of China on Taiwan. Uh, I would like to propose a, an alternative, right, uh, non-exclusive, and constructivist approach, inspired in part by, by Adam McEwen's scholarship, uh, by what uh, some scholars have called critical Han studies, and by Sinophone literary and, and cultural studies. Uh, this global Chinese history, if as it were, emphasizes the experiences and connections between persons, societies, and states in different settings that saw themselves or were seen and produced by others as quote unquote Chinese, right? This, this approach uh, doesn't limit itself to, to literary and cultural texts uh, either. This is an approach that treats sinicization and desinicization in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, right? Southeast Asia, um, in relation to, to Manchus, to, to Uyghurs, to the indigenous peoples of Taiwan, to Chinese in the Philippines, to Hong Kongers, right, to ethnic Chinese Singaporeans. It treats these processes of sinicization and desinicization as, as comparable, as comparable processes that span geographies and that are embedded in distinct, multiple overlapping historical contexts, right, and, and political processes. Uh, I think this, this approach has political and, and ethical ramifications, uh, not to mention uh, practical, uh, uh, not to mention uh, pragmatic significance. Um, so the terms Chinese and China are powerful, but ambiguous and contested signifiers. Uh, racist demagogues and authoritarian states, such as the PRC today, Right, such as the martial law Republic of China, um, such as New Order Indonesia, for example, have all deployed these terms Chinese in China, right, to categorize, essentialize, and inflict great harm on, on, on peoples. And so for this, these reasons, I think we owe it to, to, uh, to our peers, right, to publics to, to problematize Chineseness and, and Chinese history. Uh, I will also say that given the increasing inaccessibility of archives in the PRC, um, global, you know, global Chinese history, I think, can help us, can help call attention to Chinese language materials um, beyond the PRC uh, that relatively fewer scholars have, 
have made use of. Okay, so that's uh, that's more or less it. Thank you so much. Uh, if you are interested in buying the book, you can do so for thirty percent off for by going to the Cornell University Press website and entering the the following code. Um, I I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Jen Wood. Thank you for a fantastic presentation and uh, a very compelling conclusion, I would say. Um, it looks like we already have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, just a reminder for everyone in our audience, you can submit questions for Jen Wood to answer by um, entering them into the YouTube or Facebook comment section, whichever one you're using. OK, so uh, the first question kind of relates to um, one of your kind of concluding uh, statements about kind of the, the strategies of the CCP today in the Philippines, which is how different are the views of the younger Philippine Chinese today compared to their elders that grew up under the influence of the KMT? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. Uh, not many of them are aware of the history, uh, the you know the, the history of the community and their the community's uh, ties to the to the Republic of China, right? During the uh, during the Cold War, uh, there to the extent that Chineseness is a concern for them, uh, a lot of this has to do again with sort of the Philippines' present day relations with the PRC, with you know, territorial uh, with with the territorial disputes in the so-called South China Sea, or for Filipinos, the West uh, the West Philippine Sea. Um, a, a lot of tensions have arisen because of recent immigrants from China to the Philippines, many of whom have ended up working in it's sort of the the online gambling uh, industry uh, in the Philippines, which again, whose whose clientele mostly consists of persons in uh, in China, um, again, a lot of them are wrestling with, I would say, wrestling with accusations of, of disloyalty, uh, accusations of, you know, of being accusations of disloyalty that are not in that, not that dissimilar in some ways from, from the kinds of accusations of disloyalty that, that, that were, that were being uh, thrown about during the, during the Cold War. Um, the idea that even though these persons have long since assimilated into the Filipino body politic, even though these persons are, are multilingual or, or oftentimes, you know, oftentimes speak better. Typically, almost all of them, young, younger Filipino Chinese today, speak better, uh, better Tagalog or other Filipino languages compared to uh, compared to Hokkien. Right? A lot of them don't don't speak don't speak any Chinese. Um, Yet that, that the question of their Chineseness keeps on keeps on resurfacing in part because of geopolitics, right? Because of interestingly enough, uh, contemporary Chinese migration uh, to the to the to the Philippines, uh, and so they find themselves having to sort of fend off these these accusations of of disloyalty, um, which again are unfortunate, uh, but which also I think. Um, point to certain sort of long long term trends in 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 the history of the the community um no one really cares about about taiwan anymore even chiang kai shek high school um these days isn't isn't especially uh isn't especially uh pro pro roc uh and there, there are real you know there are real struggles i think on the part of of um slightly older but more liberal filipino chinese to get younger Filipinos to sort of connect with their Chinese heritage in a way that doesn't necessarily mean identifying with a with a particular Chinese Chinese state right so so one of the concerns for 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 uh, Chinese educators in the Philippines is how to encourage how to maintain Hokkien right uh, as as sort of a a language that younger Filipino Chinese are, are conversant in uh, given that increasingly few Filipino Chinese, young Filipino Chinese today speak speak Hokkien. Okay. Thank you, Jinwen. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Um, could you share a bit more about the shared sovereignty between the ROC, 
the Philippines and Tsunoy. How does this idea differ from alliances between sovereignties? Thank you. Right. So, so, so the idea here is that the Philippine government willingly outsourced a portion of its of its sovereignty over persons who happen to be living re residing in in the Philippines and who who were uh, who happened to be who identified themselves or identified by others as as Chinese. Right? So this is not a, not not about territory. We, we think, for example, uh, during the during the Cold War, of course, uh, the United States had, had military bases in the in the Philippines, and and these bases are frequently understood in, in neo-colonial terms. This was more or less something that the United States was able to impose uh, upon the Philippines uh, by leveraging its relative its relative military and economic power. Uh, I don't see that kind of dynamic in in the case of sort of the the Philippine uh, the Philippines relationship with the ROC. Both were relatively small. Uh, relative, well, small, medium-sized, small, medium-sized states. And so that that my use of the shared sovereignty is, is mostly about sort of getting us to think about relatively equal power relations between, between, uh, between states and the willingness of states to allow other states to operate um, other states and, and their affiliated organizations, the KMT, to operate sort of semi-autonomously on uh, on foreign territory, although even though the Kuomintang's uh, the Republic of China's presence in the Philippines was not territorialized in, in say, the way that that the U.S. military presence was, right? The, the, their, their, their presence was very much, uh, their sovereignty was very much about sovereignty over persons rather than than territory, and and so that's what that's what I'm I'm trying to get at in 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 using this this term. Um, I, I I started off actually by I wanted to use the term neocolonialism because this is a term that some Filipino uh, some Filipino journalists had used to characterize the Kuomintang, especially following the the arrest and deportation of the Yutongs in 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 1970. But um, a uh, one of my advisors, um, Professor Caroline Howe, uh, who herself is is, is uh, Filipino, um, said to me, "You should not use this term. It's overused. You should think about some." A different way of of framing this this particular uh, configuration of of relations, and so I eventually found uh, a term uh, that seemed to uh, broadly fit um, the the and uh, the the relationship that I uh, that I was interested in. Thank you, Jenwen. I I might ask just a really quick follow up question. I wonder what you might think about the term sub imperial or Maybe, maybe a framework proposed by Chen Guanxing. Um, do you see the ROC as maybe like a neo-colonial? I think you know there there are lots of it, it's a, it's a rather nebulous term. It's used in a very wide-ranging fashion. But I wonder what you think about other kinds of terms that are maybe adjacent but slightly more specific. Yeah, I think that term would work. I, I have, I think at one point in time I did include that in my. In, in one of my earlier drafts, um, but I think someone someone might have told me to to take it out, so I, I so I did. But yeah, I think I think it it does it does work. Although uh, the way that I understand Chen Guangxing's use of the term, he's using it chiefly to talk about sort of uh, the south south uh, the southbound policy, right? The the um, and I I don't yeah so that. Uh, he's interested in uh, Li Denghui's, uh you know, southbound policy. Um, I don't think that quite fits what I'm trying to do. Um, it's, it's not about sort of Taiwanese economic investment in, in in Southeast Asia, right? Which is, I think, what he he's getting at. Um, it's 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 not about sort of yeah. It's about it's about the state, and it sort of goes back. It can be traced back to to the Kuomintang's efforts at at established itself as a as a diasporic organization in the, in the 1930s. Uh, I don't know if you could, you know, I don't know if you can call what the Kuomintang was getting up to in the 1930s uh, as 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 sub imperial, right? But but certainly, which is why again the term may not necessarily be the 
uh, be the best fit here. Makes sense. Thank you for elaborating on that. Okay, next question is from uh, Professor Howard Young. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I see your context-based approach to constructions of Sinitic language, ideology, and identity very much in line with the approach of Sinophone studies. Do you think your conclusions, both substan substantive and methodological, about the history of Chineseness can be extended beyond the Cold War framework? Yeah, I know. I haven't thought much about beyond that that Cold War framework, uh, except perhaps in a in a sort of a, in, in within the context of sort of Chinese migration history. But but yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, a lot of so earlier during my presentation, I, I shared a book called Ambition and Identity, which was by a guy called Andrew Wilson. He was a student of the late Philip Kuhn, actually, at, at Harvard. So he was trained in modern Chinese history, but he wrote his dissertation and then book on the Chinese community in the Philippines in sort of the at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, a lot of my my insights into the dynamics of the community, I think, uh, are, are, are based on what Andrew Wilson, um, who now works at the Naval Postgraduate School or some some military military academy. Uh, a lot of my insights are actually derived from from his book. Um, how he argues that the the he argues in that book that the Philippine Chinese at the turn of the 20th century, it, it sort of negotiated the transition from the Qing Empire to the Republic by sort of playing um, playing multiple sides and drawing upon, crucially drawing upon external sources of authority, uh, whether Qing or Republican, to sort of legitimize their own um, their own place within this within this community to sort of consolidate, it's about the protection and consolidation of, of class and, and status um, during, this, during, this, during this period, which also of course coincided with the, with the uh, transition from Spanish to, to Philippine rule, uh, to, to Spanish to American rule um, in the Philippines. So yes, I, I do think that this, this approach is, uh, is flexible. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, my, my current work, I think, tries to engage with, um, with with these these concerns uh in a post cold war but i would think what consider sort of a post cold war setting right that being sort of 1970s and, and 80s uh uh singapore uh so absolutely i think i think uh this 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 approach is is flexible and adaptable to <laughs> to different circumstances and i wouldn't see i wouldn't be surprised if it applies to for example non other other minority communities um uh in other parts of the world uh, to other other diaspora communities, um, for example, which uh, that that states uh, laid laid claim to, um, and that's again something that I you know I, I'd love to see more of. Yeah, I wonder if um, if I could also kind of jump in on this question. I I, I agree with Howard's kind of general um, general conclusion, which is that the arguments and the conclusions that we can draw from your book, I think are very much in line with what Sinophone Studies is also attempting to accomplish, to decenter um, both the, the Chinese nation state and to think critically about the construction of Chineseness, or in your words, sinicization and desinicization. Um, I wonder if you if you see your work as, you know, maybe speaking beyond that, or if there are areas where, where you're looking to to also maybe draw Sinophone studies to new conclusions? Uh, so, I mean, I have, you know, uh, without my, my, you know, as a historian, of course, I, I, my, my, I guess my main concern with Sinophone studies is that it sometimes is insufficiently historical, but you know, that's, a, that's a, that's kind of what you expect a, a historian to say. Uh, I, I would, like Sinophone studies to perhaps become more inclusive of persons who aren't working in sort of literary and, and cultural studies uh, uh, fairly you know narrowly defined. I, I would like sort of Sinophone studies to sort of embrace history and the the kinds of methods and 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 sources that historians can can bring to the to the conversation. Uh, especially because so many 
invocations of Chineseness today, uh, you know, Chineseness globally today uh, are grounded in sort of um, a certain historical logic, right? or maybe a historical logic even that I think historians can help uh, critique. Right? That so many of the, I mean, just just take just just take debates about about Taiwan, for example. So many of them are grounded in in bad in bad history or, or in in in, uh, in ignorance of history, and that's where people like like James, like where you come, where you come in to say, hey, wait, uh, let me tell you a bit about the history here. So I think I think that that historicization is is absolutely essential when it comes to uh, pushing back uh, against um, you know understandings of Chineseness advanced not just by by sinicizing states uh, or the sinicizing the chief the primary sinicizing state in the world today, but by but by members of the the community as well. So you you know you take Singapore Singapore as an example for example. Take Singapore as a, as, a, as a site for thinking about Chineseness. It's fascinating to think about how hegemonic and essentialist notions of Chineseness have become internalized by so many people and and circulate fairly uh, fairly widely among among um, among members of the community. Obviously, Singapore is slightly different in that you know, this has always been sort of a this has been an ethnic Chinese uh, majority country for for a while uh, now. Um, but again, I think that's where historians can come in. Right? That's where we can point out that, hey, you know, the, the history of the Chinese community in, the, in this country, in, the, in, in Singapore, isn't just a history of, of economic growth and prosperity. There's, there's, uh, there's a great deal of, of racism um, taking place, right? Racism that, that is in part the product of, yes, British imperial rule and, and the racial categories of, of British imperial rule, but also a... a, a um, but also a, a product of sort of uh, the, the Chinese supermajority and and Chinese Chinese cultural and and political hegemony, right? and that's that's evident if you look at when you look at what sort of very prominent and well respected Chinese leaders in this community have said uh, some pretty shocking stuff, right? I'm not not just talking about Lee Kuan Yew, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jen Wen. Um, yeah. I, I have some questions that um, I think are, are slightly broader questions. The first one sure. is uh, specifically about chapter six. So this is where, you know, okay. overseas Chinese come to visit the ROC. And yeah. um, one of the things I, I like to teach in my classes is that, you know, there is a certain amount of um, pedagogy in how a state conveys to its citizens what it stands for and what it mm. represents. And I thought chapter six is is the perfect example of this. So I'd, I'd love to hear you maybe spend a couple minutes telling the audience about chapter six, about how Philippine Chinese experienced the ROC. And also, I'd, I'd like to ask if you could maybe expound upon that to discuss how that ROC then, you know, in its occupation of Taiwan and in its project of synthesizing Taiwan, then um, how did those projects kind of overlap. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, so chapter six of the book is about uh, visits, organized group visits that Filipino Chinese organizations made to Taiwan from the 50s to the 70s. There's actually a ton of material on these on, on individual visits. I, I was deluged with material on, on all manner of visits by all manner of organizations. And so methodologically, uh, and this was the chapter, interestingly enough, that I started working on first uh, during my dissertation. Uh, interestingly enough, the, 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 so one of the major challenges for me was figure out how I was going to represent these visits because I could not possibly talk about every single one. So I had to sort of pick and choose the, the visits that I, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and so that's how I ended up settling on the on the three visits that I that I talk about in in the chapter, right? Which are I tried to sort of space out across the the entire uh, time period. Um, the concept that I use to to frame this chapter is experiential nationalism. The idea that, and, and this goes back to what you were saying about about pedagogy, which is the idea that um, nationalism cannot just be something that one 
uh, the nation cannot simply be something one reads about uh, and that one experiences vicariously, but it has to be something that one is immersed in. And, and that, that, that underpins, I think, the logic of these, these visits, these trips from the, the ROC point of view, because these visits were highly structured, right? So the, the ROC, uh, there were ROC uh, officials who accompanied these, these tours, uh, who answered their questions. There was a strict, uh, there was a dress code. Uh, there was a strict code of conduct, including not speaking, <laughs> including, for example, um, speaking Mandarin. Uh, you were not allowed to sort of, you had to stick to the itinerary that was assigned. You couldn't just sort of wander off on your own and start and, and wander uh, you know, and, and go for your own little adventure in Taipei. Uh, a lot of these trips entail, again, visiting sites in Taiwan or in uh, Jinmen, right, that had been set aside for these educational, pedagogic, experiential, nationalist purposes. So again, if you look at the places that they visited, right, Jinmen was a, was a you know, Jinmen was sort of, yes, it was a Cold War island, but it was also meant to showcase the the ROCs, it was meant to showcase and to, to embody the ROC's struggle against, against communism, right? And so lots of lots of lots of tour groups ended up going to Jinmen to, you know, to take pictures, to talk to locals and in, in, in sort of what were pre-arranged uh, pre-arranged uh, uh, photo ops. Right? So they in, in, in Taiwan itself, they would go to you know, the usual, the usual sites, right? Sun Moon Lake, uh, they would visit schools, they would visit infrastructure projects in sites that were meant to convey certain ideas of tradition and modernity, right? That, that nations um, or nation states wish to, wish to embody. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the, that's the chapter. Um, I also argue in the chapter that, you know, despite the, that understand to the extent that we can read these texts carefully and read between the lines, we find that a lot of, we find that the, the persons who went on these trips understood these trips in, 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 much, in a much more quotidian, much more conventional, uh, less ideological terms. Uh, even though the, the language of these, the, 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 the documents themselves, right, these, these commemorative volumes that were published, again, um, are not entirely, are, are full of propaganda, but one needs to sort of read between the lines and to figure out the ways in which um, more everyday concerns and more practical concerns were were manifested in these in these documents. Uh, sorry, did I was did you have a did I did I there was another question you had. The overlap with the ROC project in Oh yeah, right. Poland so the, the overlap. Yeah. So again, I mean I, I yeah, that, that's something that that I absolutely I think I think the book can and and you know can it should be read alongside scholarship on Sinicization in, in, in Taiwan um, itself. Uh, there were, uh, that said, I think it's the, the key difference is that has to do again with the, again, it has to do with state, with the state, with, with, with sovereignty, right? So the, in Taiwan, of course, the state is much more able to assert itself to to it's much more capable of intervening in what it considers to be Chinese quote unquote Chinese society whereas obviously in the Philippines and elsewhere uh, the state is much less is much less of a uh, it's not the it's not the only state that the ROC state isn't the only one um, trying to intervene in, in, in these communities so there's the the physical distance uh, you know, I think complicates complicates things for the for the uh, uh, for the ROC and the Guangdong in, in in the Philippines. The fact that it has to sort of contend with the uh, the Philippine authorities as well. That it has to contend with well, I guess the same. You could say the same thing about Taiwan, right? It's the same contend with sort of private private interests, and he has to work with existing work through existing elites. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say no. I absolutely. I think I think that that. Um, I think that, yeah, it does. There is something to be said about 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 the ROC's project of sinicization in in, in different uh, in different sites, um, but again, not something that unfortunately I was able to uh, 
talk too much about in the book. Your answer to to Howard's last question, you mentioned that you know, like you're thinking about the post Cold War context for the next project. And yeah. so let's let's hear about it. Can you tell us more? Oh, about okay, it? sure. <laughs> so I was so I'm working on sort of a I'm trying to understand the the Singapore Chinese community and the various um, projects that the state uh, that the Singapore government um, uh, executed with respect to this community in the 1970s and 80s. I'm trying to understand these projects in a lot larger transnational context. These were these were what I consider to be cultural engineering projects, uh, sinicization projects in, in in many respects, right? Uh, efforts to promote Mandarin, for example, in 1979. Efforts to promote Confucian ethics, starting in in 1982. Projects which uh, again historians really haven't written about. Social scientists have. Uh, but which, res which as, as someone who sort of is interested in China and Taiwan as well, which really sort of recall and and uh, and, and resonate with with what earlier sinicizing states uh, were, were up to. Uh, this is also a period in which Singaporeans are able to visit China much more readily. This is a period in which Chinese, uh, uh, you know, Chinese. Uh, university debate teams, uh, drama troops are able to to visit Singapore. So there's a t and 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 more than that, and and this is the historian of me speaking. There's just a ton of material out there, uh, readily accessible, which no one appears to have really looked at, or historians certainly haven't haven't looked at because historians' attentions uh, tend to be focused uh, on, on 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 an earlier period in in, in Singapore history. So, so that's how I'm trying to, you know, sort of think about um, sinicization uh, in in Singapore during this period. The extent to which, for example, these projects drew upon Taiwanese expertise. So, in in some of the Speak Mandarin propaganda that I came across, and some of the Speak Mandarin materials that I came across, you know, you have you have these university professors from from Taiwan um, coming to Singapore and studying how Chinese teachers in Singapore are, and, and students in Singapore are speaking Mandarin and producing these reports critiquing uh, just how bad Mandarin is. And obviously these people, these, these, are, these are sort of Kuomintang uh, aligned uh, academics in, in Taiwan, but they're coming in, they're, they're proffering, they're offering all sorts of advice on, on how um, you know, Chinese Mandarin standards in Singapore um, are, are, are not high enough, right? Um, like Taiwanese professors are coming in to sort of offer advice on on uh, on on the promotion of Confucian ethics. Uh, persons affiliated with um, you know various the, the Sino uh, very, various uh, Confucian associations in 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 Taiwan and, and in China, right? Um, but at, at sort of the level of popular culture, one one really interesting angle is has to do with Taiwanese campus songs and how Taiwanese uh, popular music really sort of resonated with young Singaporean Mandarin um, songwriters in, in Singapore. And so there's, I, I'm, I'm just really interested in, 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 in these kinds of cultural exchanges and how, for example, Taiwanese pop music became, became a really big thing here. Um, in in the 1980s, how it sort of inspired the the local uh, Mandarin uh, music scene, and how many of these these, these uh, what we call Xinyao uh, songwriters in uh, in Singapore, how many of them ended up going to Taiwan to make a to make uh, to make a name for themselves, right? How they went to Taiwan, maybe and were even signed up by sort of major Taiwanese uh, or Hong Kong um, um, recording companies. So those are the kinds of things that I'm interested in. I don't, I'm not sure how it all fits together yet, but, but there is a lot of very interesting material out there. That's fascinating. And so, uh, I mean, I don't know too much about Singaporean history, but my assumption is that the, the connections with Taiwan specifically, I assume are because Taiwan is seen as perhaps being the more traditional or the more authentic Chinese culture, is that correct? Well, there's that. So, you know, but there's also, but Singapore also adopts many 
features of Chinese culture that aren't, that are actually quite, you know, that are, that originate from the PRC. That, for example, the use of simplified characters starting in 19, about the, in the late 1960s. Uh, the adoption of, uh, the adoption of Hanyu Pin, for example, which sort of gradually replaces Zhu Yin Fu Hao as sort of the, uh, as the, the preferred romanization system in, in, in Singapore. A lot of older Singaporeans actually learn both Zhu Yin Fu Hao and Han Yuping in, in schools. Uh, so there's, there, there's, there's a sense in which Singapore state and Singaporeans are sort of borrowing um, fairly eclectically from, from both China and Taiwan, and you know, obviously from, from, from Hong Kong um, as, as well. Uh, on the on the traditionalist side of things, I mean, there's what's really interesting is that the the I've come across archival material on how the China Confucius Association in Taiwan, which is headed by none other than uh, Chen Li Fu uh, of the CC Click fame, uh, how they are, you know, they want to sort of get in on the, they want to sort of capitalize on Singapore's efforts to promote Confucian ethics by, for example, uh, donating a statue of Confucius to the Singapore government for, uh, to be displayed at, which is still, I believe, on display at, at a place in Singapore called the Chinese Garden. So these kinds of, you know, these kinds of cultural exchanges are sort of are really interesting to me. Uh, it's it's not always the easiest finding uh, material or let alone archival material on this kind of thing. But I'm you know it's it's nice working on sources that aren't just archival sources. <laughs> I, I'm I've I've I'm maybe a little tired of reading just mostly archival sources. Last well, ROC ROC documents, <laughs> ROC foreign ministry documents. Mm. Yeah, might get you in trouble. Okay, um, oh. I. I guess the the second part of the question I didn't I didn't ask you is you know the part of my assumption is that you know these exchanges aren't occurring because of what might be a more obvious connection between Taiwan and Singapore. So there's no connection between, for example, building hook in language, I assume. And that I, I guess that answers a big part of the question. Yeah, so that I I don't know, right? I, I uh, interestingly enough, there's a there's a I just went to the Tianmen Hui Guan in in Singapore, the the the, the Kimoi Clan Association in in Singapore, whose history I'm kind of interested in investigating. Uh, but this was mostly you know to sort of understand understand speak Mandarin. Yeah, so I'm I'm really curious about Singaporeans who studied in Taiwan. There weren't as many. Okay, so Malaysia. Is is really much more. Many more Malaysians were in ended up in in Taiwan than, than Singaporeans. But I'm sort of curious about how Singaporeans who ended in Taiwan ended up sort of taking adopting what I consider to be fairly liberal uh, perspectives on 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 Chinese culture. A lot of persons who uh, a lot of Singaporeans who went to Taiwan ended up becoming sort of sort of uh, Chinese studies academics in this country and and adopting fairly fairly progressive uh, approaches to to Chinese culture. Um, here, uh, but I'm not again. I'm not sure how 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 one goes about um, studying those connections yet. I, I have found some evidence of sort of like the the Taida Singapore Alumni Association, for example, but they, I'm not sure if they they did very much. Yeah, I suppose it'd be interesting to see if um, there are any instances of these kind of counter -hege hegemonic connections, like you know, Hokkien language. Um, I'm just reading a new book. Uh, Meredith Schweig's Renegade Rhymes. And you know, I think that a lot of studies of music in Taiwan have focused on Mandarin music, you know, Teresa mm. and the representations of traditional Chinese culture. But Schweig's book is really interesting because she's looking at um, the legacies. So she's looking at rap specifically. And mm. rap, of course, has roots in uh, the Western world. But also she looks at the roots of rap in uh, pre Guomindang, Hokkien mm. and Hakka spoken songs, mm. and that's quite interesting because it's it's something that not many people have studied, presumably because of the overwhelming hegemony of of you know synthetic studies. Um, yeah, so if you find anything that's similar to that, that that'd be quite interesting to hear about. 
Yeah. So so thing about Singapore is that it, it's not as if Mandarin was simply imposed from above onto the uh, community starting in 1979, because Mandarin had always been, you know, Mandarin had been taught in schools uh, starting in the 1930s, right? Because of uh, because of what the the Republic of China had had had, had, had mandated. Uh, so Mandarin was always spoken by a portion of the of the community, right? It was sort of it did serve as sort of a a common language for for the different Chinese so-called dialect groups in, in in this country. But what happens, of course, after 1979 is not only that Mandarin is promoted, but that so-called dialect is 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 is, is, is forbidden. And so my sense is that this campaign was for a lot of people, it didn't matter that much because they, you know, when one grows up in Singapore, one sort of develops this, well, not me, but older Singaporeans, many older Chinese Singaporeans uh, sort of have developed this remarkable facility for multiple Chinese languages. My mom, for example, can speak Chinese, Mandarin, Hokkien, and Cantonese, right? So switching between these languages wasn't such an issue for many, for many uh, Chinese Singaporeans. Uh, but it did, but speak Mandarin did affect persons whose livelihoods depended on Mandarin. For example, um, persons, uh, uh, storytellers, radio storytellers, who's, who's living, you know, who's very, whose identity and profession was very much grounded in Hokkien or Cantonese storytelling, for example, uh, uh, persons, or, or there's a class dimension to this as well, because again, um, persons who, who, you know, did not receive a formal education. Chinese persons who didn't receive a formal education in Singapore often tended to be more monolingual and less able to sort of switch between Mandarin and 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 and, and other languages. So there's that dimension as well, and you can see that from the campaigns that that targeted again bus drivers. We need to get bus drivers to speak Mandarin. We need to get we need to get hawkers, uh, street food. You know, people selling street food to speak Mandarin. <laughs> The, the ways that these the campaigns sort of targeted certain specific professions and which manifested certain class dimensions. And all the people who were seen okay with Mandarin were, were elites, with we speak Mandarin were, were elites or persons who uh, knew multiple languages. So again, that's I think I think that's slightly different from sort of the the, the Taiwanese um, setting where I, I think that in Mandarin was much less widespread in say 1949 or 45. Yeah, I think in Taiwan, you also have the case where um, because of, you know, government mandated preferences for, for native Mandarin speakers, you had an automatic kind of built-in preference for Weissenden in any mm. positions where, you know, language fluency was considered yeah. important, despite the yeah, fact plus, that many, many Weissenden- Yeah, plus in Singapore, you also need to take into account that Mandarin was sort of being promoted at the same time as English, uh -huh. right? So the Chinese community, that that the Chinese persons, the older Chinese persons that I've spoken to, a, a lot of them, it wasn't so much speak Mandarin that was a concern. It was the fact that English was becoming increasingly dominant, right? Uh, it was Anglicization rather than Sinicization that was that was a that was a concern because if you didn't speak English again, you were a certain professional. You are sort of disadvantaged on the on the job market, uh, so English was as much a concern as as Mandarin was. Uh, we have another audience question: okay. Did the KMT Philippines help the Philippine government prevent uh, Huck? Uh, you have to pardon the my Huk, yeah, yeah, the Huck Yep. Yeah, the Huck led Luis by Luis Taruk influence communist ideology to the Hua Chao community yep. and counter guerrillas against it. Because during World War II in the Philippines, the Hua Chao community yeah. built. A uh, group of guerrilla led by yeah. uh, Hua Zhi, Squadron 48, yeah, Zhi, yeah. that some of them were uh, Hua Chao communist combatants. Yeah, so I explained, yes, so the, the Hua Chao, during the Second World War, uh, there were a number of anti-Japanese guerrilla organizations, the most well-known of which was the was, was Squadron 48, right? The, the, the Hua Zhi, which uh, was a, a left-leaning organization. The Kuomintang had it sort of its own uh, anti-Japanese organizations as well, uh, some of which again were were, were sort of uh, were, were organized by 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 special agents, 
Chiang Kai-shek special agents from, from, from China uh, itself. Uh, following the war, the persons affiliated with these guerrilla, these left-wing guerrilla organizations, as I, as I mentioned, ended up sort of losing out to the, to the Guomindang from, from in the late to mid, uh, from the mid to late 1940s, and such that by the end of the 1940s, most of these uh, Hua Chao, uh, these left-leaning Hua Chao leaders had left the Philippines for China. After all, things were looking up in, in China uh, from their perspective. The remaining sort of committed Chinese leftists uh, who did end up, you know, they, they did end up throwing in their lot with the, the Hukpa Lahap, right? There, there was, there's always been fairly close coordination. Uh, there was close coordinations. There was coordination between Chinese and Filipino leftists uh, during the war, and there was an attempt after the war to maintain this relationship. But what we find is that the Chinese, the Chinese presence within sort of the Filipino left-wing movement after 1949 sort of dwindles, uh, and their relationship sort of becomes frayed and fairly distant. Uh, and, and this is evident from 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 what happens in the 1950s, right? Where you have attempts by Chinese communists, uh, the fragments, the remnants of the Chinese communist movement to, to re-establish ties with the Hukbalahap, which are largely unsuccessful. So, um, so by that point in time, the 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 you know the Chinese leftist presence in the in the in in the country has is entirely underground and it's it's largely ineffectual. It, it doesn't really get up to, it, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really do very much, but obviously it's still, in the eyes of the authorities, it's still very much a, a, a threat, right? There's still this fear that, on the part of the authorities, that the that the Chinese are going to be linking up with the with the Hukbal Hub. Um, but the Hukbal Hub are by far the the biggest act in town. They are the, they are whom the Filipino government and its U.S. allies are concentrated on. The Chinese are sort of, Chinese presence is kind of like, a part of that, but it's not really that big of a, uh, not that big of a deal. Um, and yes, and, and to answer the question directly, yes, the Philippine government was, was the Guomindang, right, was at the forefront of trying to prevent, uh, trying to sort of combat uh, communist ideology or to, to propagate anti-communist ideology in the in, within the, the Chinese community, although it, it, it's interesting that most of their most of their rhetoric was focused not so much on the Filipino scene, uh, but on China, right? That their that their anti-communism was very much Chinese, China-centered anti-communism, um, within obviously a sort of a wider sort of global Cold War context. But the the ultimate aim of such of, of propaganda efforts was to sort of channel was to direct one's attention to uh, China because that was where that was that was where the fate of the free world lay. Okay, thank you, Jim Wen. I don't think we have any other questions from the audience. Um, so we're almost we're almost at time. So I'm happy to end it here. Um, I'll say once again, thank you so much for sharing your book with us. Um, it's wonderful to learn about uh, a different aspect of the ROC, which we learn about from mostly a Taiwan perspective, but we have to realize that the ROC on Taiwan was, as you say, it was a transnational state. And uh, well, maybe I should use the word state. It was a transnational entity. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All uh, right. All right. A round of applause. Thank you so much, Jinwin. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed myself. And I'm really happy to be to be here. All right. All right. Good night, everybody.